So you'll notice that the next homework assignment isn't due till Wednesday the 29th. That, of course, is because spring break is right around the corner. So here's the assignment. You've got a little bit more time than usual to work on it. I don't think you'll need an inordinate amount of time. Uh, it looks lengthy just because there's a lot of text on the page, but the text on the page is just me giving you a lot of detailed instructions on what to do. All right. In our next class, we are going to have uh, our third quiz of the semester. And uh, in addition to questions covering today's class and last class, I'd also, also ask you to be prepared with the key concepts, which is those terminology and vocabulary words. Um, and I'll ask you a couple of questions from the, ch the list of terms that relate to chapter 8. So just be prepared to define what they are. Uh, what we're going to do today is begin with a demonstration on uh, where land use and soil type data comes from. And uh, then once we do that, we're going to talk about some of the uh, thinking behind the NRCS unit hydrograph method. So let's begin with that demonstration of GIS data. How many of you already installed Google Earth Pro? Everybody already did that? All right. What we're going to use it for is we're going to get some of the uh, data from the USDA. And it's just a, a easy, free way to open up shape files. And shape files are usually opened up by a program called ArcMap, ArcView, ArcGIS, uh, made by Esri. But their, pro their software isn't free. They have, I think, some viewers that maybe can open shape files for free. But I just kind of uh, prefer Google Earth Pro. So uh, let's actually begin by going to the Web Soil Survey. So open up your browser. And um, you can just do a Google search for Web Soil Survey rather than typing in that whole address. And I think it's most likely going to be the first thing that comes up, Web Soil Survey. All right. So the nice thing about this site is it allows you to browse the data that's available based on areas of interest that you can define. So when we click the little button to start the web soil survey, you can see it begins with a map of the US. And uh, let's zoom in on our neck of the woods using this tool here, the zoom tool. You uh, give it a box, and then it'll zoom in on the extents of the box. So we do it on the tri-state area. And Let's zoom in on a, a section of land that's just north of Milton. It doesn't matter exactly where, because we're going to see about the same stuff regardless of where we zoom into. Um, all right, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that you can define the area of interest um, using this AOI rectangle. But you can also import areas of interest. And for the homework assignment that you're going to be doing, submitting in two weeks, uh, you need to import an area of interest that's posted on MU Online. And it's actually, I think, a zip file is the way that the formatting works. So that's where you'd use this tool, import area of interest. But in our case, we're going to define an area of interest just by uh, drawing a rectangle over a certain area. So if we do that and say, this is our area of interest, then what it does is essentially goes to the web and downloads some of the soil characteristics for this zone. And there are a lot of really interesting reports that it can generate based on that soil data and other information that it has running in the background. So we'll look at some of that. Um, so now that we've defined our area of interest, let's go to this tab here that says Soil Map. And... Um, the soil map that it creates includes all of the different soil classifications inside of this area. And you'll notice that it's really detailed. Now, to generate um, a soil map of this detail, you might initially think that maybe it's a guy who was going around and digging up soil samples and looking at it and saying what classification it was. You know, maybe it was a guy who was saying, oh, this looks like chagrin silt loam. And the area here, the, the slope here is 0 to 
but that's not exactly how it works. If you look at it, a lot of these soil classifications conform to uh, elevation contours. And so it's largely extrapolated based on, like for example, where the streams are. You know, here on the aerial photo, you can notice there's a creek that's running through this area. And it corresponds to a soil classification that's running through that same zone. So if I click on the information or the identify button, and then put my cursor down on that creek, it's going to pull up the soil type for that location. It says it's a chagrin silt loam in an area with a low slope, and it's occasionally flooded. And um, so the thing that's interesting about that is that it, it's kind of like extrapolated soil data. So although it has a high resolution and a, a a high density of these polygons, we kind of have to take what it's saying about the soil type in that location with a, a little bit of a grain of salt. Because I don't think it's, in most cases, based on like a, fizzle, a physical um, removal of a sample and testing in the lab for each location that these contours are. It's, it's kind of based on elevation data. Uh, over here on the left, it says for our er uh, area of interest, like the percent breakdown of what most of these things are. And we can get some information by clicking on these different descriptions. So just for example, let's take one, the chagrin loam that we were talking about. If I click on that, it gives a report of what kind of properties there are for this type of soil. Um, it has, based on where we are on the map, uh, an estimate of the growing conditions, like the mean temperature, the number of frost-free days. Um, and it uses some of this setting data to project how uh, crops would do, um, the productivity of forest land, and so on. But what we're mostly interested in when it comes to hydraulic modeling is down here in the interpretive groups category, where it says hydrologic soil group. So that's where we can see that this is soil class B for that area of interest. And so if we wanted to know a curve number, and let's say we had a watershed in this area, what we could do is we could look at all of the soil types in that area of interest and then look at the hydrologic soil group for each of them. So if I click on another one, the, the one that's most common, Gilpin Upshore, 35 to 70% slope. So really steep slope. If you click on that, you'll notice that the hydrologic soil group is C, which is pretty common for the areas around here for it to be hydrologic soil group C, or in some cases even D. So if we were to pick one of these that, let's see, close this, let's pick another one and see if we can find that it has classification D. No, this Vandalia is also C. You know this area well? Oh, you can do it by hydrologic soil group. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's the, uh, the soil map. And the thing that's kind of cool about it is that you can download um, the data that's in here. If we go to the Download Soils Data tab, then you click Create Download Link. And then here, it's going to create a download link. After you click that, it generates it. The nice thing is it's not like asking your email address, and it's going to get back to you never. It just sort of does it on, on the fly. Nobody ever got emails, did they? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I see. The download link was finished. Well. <laughs> they take three days to get to you, but they want you to download it lickety-split, huh? <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, so here's the download link where once you have an area of interest, if you want to download that data, uh, let's do it. And if you're following along, I'd like you to, to download this, because what we're going to do is open it up using, um, using Google Earth. And so... Um, yeah, I've done that on my desktop 
Now, I'm going to remote connect to my desktop because Google Earth is installed on the machine here in this classroom, but I do have it on my office computer. So I'm going to download that in just a minute. Any questions or comments so far about this website or what we're doing? Um, Well, I think they do occasional surveys and then any place, like if they did, if they took a sample in a spot that had a certain slope in, in this region, then it would assign every, every area that had a similar slope and uh, like proximity to a stream or proximity to a ridge line. You know, it's going to look at the slope, the elevation, and other characteristics to just extrapolate. So I think it's occasional measurements, physical measurements of the soil, uh, coupled with liberal use of uh, estimation. All right, so I've downloaded that. And um, let me connect into my office computer. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not installed? That's too bad because um, it's a fast server that they've got it. They've got it on. Alright, so if you have um, if you've got Google Earth installed, you can just start it up. Since I'm remote connecting, uh, Resolution, it'll still run. All right, we'll do our best. It'll take a few minutes for this to load because I've got a few locations that are really complicated paths, and so yours will probably finish loading before mine will. <coughs> While it's doing that, there was somewhere on here. See, what, what we've been looking at so far is a really high resolution data set called Sergo. Um, there's a relatively low resolution soil map called StatsGo. And I've downloaded it already on my computer. There's a way to get it, the, the StatsGo um, off the website for the entire state of West Virginia. The question is, is it in the Soil Data Explorer or in the map? Uh, I should have written a note to myself. I was looking at it just earlier today. The uh, Oh, here it is. All right, U.S. General Soil Map um, and Soil Survey Data. So the, the Sergo, we can download, let's say, um, certain counties and so on. But if you instead... If you instead go for the Sergo, then it's the entire state. So I want to show you the difference in resolution. You could get the entire West Virginia in 2003. Um, and the whole state, by the way, is only uh, 1.7 megabytes. And so that gives you an idea that it's not going to have the same density of shape files that this one we're about to look at. So once you've got Google Earth started, then you can import and um, let's look at both of these. Um, first of all, the Sergo I'm going to do is just based on an area of interest. And so the, uh, the file that we need to add, oh, when you import, it automatically assumes that it's going to be a text file, but you can change it to shape file for the file type down here in the bottom right to Esri shape. And if you go to spatial, and then the way to know which of these to open is just the one that's the biggest. So 838 kilobytes is the biggest one. 
from this area of interest that I downloaded earlier. So I'm going to open that now. And you can just say no to the style template. It kind of already assigns different colors to all of the um, soil areas. But it zooms in, and then if I turn it on, you can see here's all of the different um, soil types for the area that, th the same kind of thing that we were looking at before. Right now it's in kind of a side view, and so if you use your center button, you can just switch it back to a straight overhead view um, rather than looking at it, the ground from the side. Okay, so this is really high density, but if I import the other one, so I'm going to go to import, and instead of getting the Sergo, instead I'm going to get stats go and open that one up it gives the whole state and let me I don't know, its default is to do the side view so let me zoom back in on just Cabell County and switch off the high resolution one and turn this on so now it's a very coarse soil map that says you know, typically in this region, what kind of soil is the predominant one. And so it's not saying necessarily that this is the only soil type in this region, but it's the one that's most commonly found based on, for example, this is the floodplain of the river. And so that's going to be a different soil type than you'd see in the uh, hilly high slope portions of the interior that's further away from the floodplain. So the reason I point this out is later on, when we're doing watershed modeling with WMS, all of this is happening in the background. And you, you never actually have to see the soil type data. You never see the land use data. And so it will just all of a sudden give you a curve number for your watershed. And it can give you a false sense of security to have something automatic, automatically calculated. It maybe makes you think that there's no uncertainty in the data. And so the reason why I wanted to, to first of all point this out is that uh, number one, you could get a curve number from really coarse resolution data like this, but if your watershed was entirely in one of these soil types, then it would really be losing uh, some information that you could get on a finer scale. But then this finer scale data is largely extrapolated, and so you still don't want to insist that there's no possible deviation from what the computer gives you because the underlying data is uh, not always based on reality. All right, so that's the first thing I wanted to point out to you is the, uh, the soil type data. The other thing that goes into calculating curve number when we're doing WMS for our watershed preprocessor is the land use. And there is a website out there that is the uh, Land Cover Database, operated by um, USDA, I think. So if we click on this, I just will actually get it from the, the National Map Viewer. But if you wanted to download the entire United States in a single file, it's about one gigabyte. And what it does is it's an image file. And I think there are probably about 50 or 60 different colors on the image and each of those colors represents a land use. Rather than actually being a picture that you'd look at, it's um, a coded raster that um, the computer's kind of locked up. I bogged it down with the complex task of opening a link. What's a raster? Um, a raster, is, that's another word for like a bitmap. You know, like pictures are made up of, of pixels. And um, so, and just to compare and contrast, something could be vec based on vectors and it can be based on rasters. And so, um, when we were doing this, these shapes are based on the location of these lines. And I can keep zooming in, and it doesn't start to, start to get pixelated. But if this was a raster, as I start to zoom in, you can actually physically see the pixels. And so um, let me open one of those 
image files in just a moment, but I wanted to point out that you can get the entire land cover database as a single big download, but by going to the National Map Viewer, you could instead just pick one state at a time. So that's what we're going to do is go to this National Map Viewer and download GIS data. And um, it's the National Land Cover Database that we're interested in. You know, it gives you lots of different options at this National Map Viewer. It used to be that you'd go to one website to get topo maps and another website to get elevation data and then another one to get uh, this land cover database. Um, but they've tried to bring as much possible uh, together. Um, so there were different years that they've done surveys, and what's kind of interesting is you can track over time using these different surveys the, you know, how much development has occurred in a given area. And uh, from the looks of it, they do an update every five years, and so I would imagine that pretty soon they'll post the 2016 land cover database. Um, products here and I think it just lists the state options that are available. Oh yeah, you zoom to uh, a location. So um, let's zoom in on West Virginia. Lots of different options here where it's got percent developed, tree cover, and so on. There's one that has like everything. I think there's lots of different pages because they may just have certain options turned on for each of them. Um, let me show you. I went and got one of them earlier today and the resulting download when you actually bring it up in an image viewer Here's the one for West Virginia. And so they've got it as a JPEG, and that's a, only about a megabyte. But when you extract, it's kind of unusual. The, the zip file itself is 44 megabytes. But when you extract it, one of the files in that zip file is 173 megabytes. And so it's really heavily compressed. Um, so here's obviously the state, and we can zoom in. And these different shades of green will represent uh, different land cover types. Um, and it's even more visible in this, this TIFF. So let me open that up. I think I was importing it through there. What it's telling me is that it's such a big image file that it can't display all of it. And so I can either scale it down or create a super overlay. Um, I think a super overlay is basically just breaking it down into uh, smaller pieces. I did the other option before I scaled it, so I'm interested to try what a super overlay is. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Let's just give it a shot. Oh yeah, it's going to take a while. So let me do it the other way around then. Let me import it and scale it down because that didn't take too long. I guess the other thing I could have done was just crop to Cabell County, but this is getting finished pretty quickly. So it'll have all these different shades of green, and there's, what happened? Um, 
each one of these different shades corresponds to a different land use type. And so let me turn off everything else so we don't necessarily know where things are. And you can see where the creeks are. Uh, you can see where there's urban areas. And um, there's a lot of meta files here, sort of like a table of contents for this TIFF, where it explains what different color corresponds to what kind of a land use. And so you can um, make up a land use soil type table. And let me show you one that I made a while back. In one of the watersheds that I was working with, these were like the different color shades were corresponding to a certain number. And so a hydrologic model preprocessor would look at different, um, different land uses. And so each one of these rows is a different land use. And then the soil type would be A, B, C, and D. And so you can see for the areas in the watershed that was deciduous forest, then it would assign a curve number of 55 if it was soil type B, 70 if it was soil type C, 77 if it was D. And uh, so this is, you know, like in West Virginia, these are the land uses that are most commonly um, seen. Uh, it seems to me I had one that was maybe even had a few other land uses besides this, because this one doesn't have any sort of, oh wait, developed, yeah, yeah, so um, that's just an example of the input data that we're going to be using when we come back from spring break, we're actually going to start doing the watershed modeling, so I'll give you a link tonight that you can use to download and install that, um, and there's also a, a, like a serial number that you can use in order to uh, activate it. Any questions about land use or soil type data? All right. Well, um, the homework that I've given you today is largely um, based on the uh, SCS unit hydrograph method. And by the way, SCS stands for Soil Conservation Service. And that's the old name for what's now called the National Con uh, NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service. So they changed soil to be resource. Um, so if you sometimes hear SCS method or NRCS method, that's largely interchangeable. It was called the SCS when this method was developed. But you remember the uh, Snyder synthetic unit hydrograph that we took a look at before, where we're using the physical parameters of a watershed to try and predict what the uh, hydrograph would look like if we don't have an actually physically derived hydrograph for an area. It's just kind of extrapolating what the hydrograph would look like based on the slope, based on the area of the watershed, based on uh, the length of the, the flow path and so on. Well, what this unit hydrograph method does is it improves on the Snyder approach because the Snyder approach was triangular. And that's really kind of an unrealistic depiction, depiction of, the, uh, of the rising limb and, and you know, how the, the, um, the flow rate dissipates more slowly after a storm. So this is kind of an improvement on a way to calculate what's known as the lag time. And uh, let me point out that this bar represents a rainfall hydrograph. And specifically, it's excess rainfall. So it's the, uh, the time after the initial abstraction is already satisfied. 
So if we have some excess rainfall and we measure from the middle of that period of rainfall to where we see the peak, that's known as the lag time. Um, another way of referring to the location of that peak is just down here at the bottom along the horizontal axis you see T sub P. And that time to peak is measured from the beginning of the rainfall excess rather than from the midpoint of the rainfall excess. Those are the two main parameters that we use a lot. Uh, one other that's pretty commonly referred to here, and we've discussed it in class, T sub C, the time of concentration. And here that's defined as the time from the end of the rainfall until this point of inflection where the slope begins to change. All right, so the, uh, the general shape of this curve is defined by SCS. There's a table that defines it as a function of the ratio of the time to the time to peak. And so the units down here on the horizontal axis, one is just referring to um, it's where the peak is located. And so two is 200% of the time to peak, three is 300% of the time to peak, and so on. Um, that's along these axis, uh, the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, it's identifying the, uh, the flow per unit area or just the, the, the flow Q, if it's, even if it's not per unit area, the, the flow rate at some certain time relative to the peak flow rate. So you can see 1.0 is the flow rate at the peak. And so everything's relative to the time to peak and the magnitude at the peak. So if you know those two things, then the entire hydrograph is defined based on a table that looks like this. And um, we're going to be using this table later on today as we work through an exercise together. Um, there's a spreadsheet, yeah, a spreadsheet file on MU Online where this is available for to use for the exercise. All right, so this, the shape of the curve is given. And um, the way that you'd use it is, let's say, for example, that you know the curve number for a watershed. All right, so if you know the curve number for a watershed, you can use that to calculate S, the storage potential. And if you have uh, uh, elevation data for the watershed, you can get a summary of the average basin slope, which is Y. And then L is the hydraulic length, which is the distance from the furthest most point in the watershed to the outlet of the watershed. And these two physical parameters are just reported based on uh, DEM data, D digital elevation model data. And the slope, uh, not the slope, sorry, the storage is based on the curve number, which we can get from land use and soil type, which is also geospatial data. So if you know the lag time, then all of these other parameters that are important to characterizing the uh, runoff hydrograph can be calculated directly. For example, the time of concentration is five-thirds the lag time. And uh, you can also find the total length of the uh, triangular portion of the hydrograph. Um, so the lag time is really important. And Later today, after we work through this example, I'm going to tell you about some physical measurements that I've been doing out in the field to try and measure the lag time and compare it to predictions of lag time, just to see uh, if the extreme environment that we've got here in West Virginia, where we've got really high watershed slopes, how well methods like this predict what the peak flow rate is going to be and what the, time, uh, the lag time is going to be. So here's how we can apply that method to find out the, uh, the peak discharge. Let's say that we have some precipitation excess. It, yesterday, well, last time in class on Wednesday, we were calling uh, the rainfall excess. We were giving it this abbreviation P sub E. In the SCS method, that's given the capital Q. And what it actually is meaning is just an amount of uh, rainfall excess. And in the SCS method, they refer to that as direct runoff, meaning it's the precipitation that's already satisfied the initial abstraction. It's already satisfied infiltration. So it's the leftover amount of precipitation. Um, because 
they have found that slope plays a really important role in the uh, runoff. Not only is the slope accounted for in calculating the lag time, so here's the slope and the lag time, but it's also accounted for in a peaking factor that's applied. Um, now the units on this, this is in traditional units where the area is the area of the watershed in square miles and um, Q can be some, any amount of direct runoff and so we could make a unit hydrograph by assuming that the rainfall excess is one inch. But the 484 factor is just this empirical peaking factor based on a typical watershed. But if you have different types of topography, like rural flat areas that are going to have um, more infiltration, then you have to apply a different peaking factor to bring the, uh, the amount of runoff even lower than it would, say, in an urban area where the peaking factor is higher. So just to try this approach out, uh, let's consider a watershed that has an area of three square miles and assume that we've already gone through the steps necessary to estimate a curve number, like we already assessed the uh, soil type and the land use that's going on in that area. And so um, let's make the uh, unit hydrograph based on a 3% slope and 1.2 mile hydraulic length. So I've outlined the steps that you'll need here. Um, the other part of it, besides these calculations that you'll begin by hand, peak, the peak discharge, but then once you know the peak discharge, then apply that to this to find out not just the time ratio and the discharge ratio, but the actual time in one column and the flow rate in the other. In case it's useful, I've just pasted the formula that converts between curve number and storage down there at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so you have the units on the previous slide once you get to this formula for Q sub P, but for the, uh, the lag time formula, the L needs to be in feet. Uh, the S that you calculate, that's based in inches. The Y is percent, and so for our percent slope, you'll put in the number 3. You won't put in 0 .03. It'll be an, an integer of 3. So we start off by calculating the lag time. People got 0.656 hours, right? So what that tells us is for a watershed of this size and slope and flow path length that for some storm it's going to take 0.656 hours from the lag time until the peak occurs. Now what's really tricky about that is that we know from some of our other previous estimates of time of concentration that rainfall intensity can influence that, right? Where if you have a really high intensity storm, that's going to decrease the amount of time it takes for the peak flow to arrive. But this method isn't sensitive to that. So that's one of the shortcomings of this approach. There are a lot of nice things about it. For example, how easy it is, is to use, but as with everything, what you gain in ease of use, you sacrifice in accuracy. So we can calculate the time to peak, and then the way that this Q sub P formula works is we have our standard peaking factor, 484, put in the area in square miles. Q here was the amount of rainfall excess, and so if we're doing a unit hydrograph, we want to know how much flow rate there's going to be per inch of rainfall excess. 
putting in the T sub P for that. So it means that there's going to be 1,992 cubic feet per second of runoff per inch of rainfall excess. And that's the peak flow. So that is tying the, uh, at the 1.0. So now with that information, we know the peak flow and we know the time to peak. What I'd like you to do is apply it to this data so that we have time in minutes. Oh, let's enable the editing here because the, uh, the question asks, The, the question in the example is, what is the flow rate at 87 minutes if we do have the one inch of rainfall excess? So we're going to have here time in minutes and then uh, runoff in CFS. All right. I'm going to uh, work on this, but I'm going to blind my screen because I want you to uh, try and figure it out your own way without following what I'm doing, and then we'll compare results in just a moment. So once you have a table, then also turn it into a chart that's a depiction of the hydrograph. So in the paper calculations, we found out two important things. We found the time to peak, and we found the peak flow rate. And in this case, we were assuming a unit of runoff excess, uh, of rainfall excess. And so this is the units here, CFS per inch of rainfall excess. So we take those two data points and we're going to apply it to the ratio of time to time to peak and the discharge ratio, Q to Q sub peak. And so uh, I want to convert that into from a time ratio to an actual time. So I'm multiplying this time ratio by the time to peak, which I've converted from hours into minutes by simply multiplying by 60. So now we've got a time column, and then this runoff column is just based on the peak flow rate that we'd calculated on paper multiplied by the discharge ratio. And so what we should expect is if, if we know the time to peak is 7.29 hours, which turns out to be 43.7 minutes. Well, here's that 43.7 minutes, and it's the 1992 is the peak flow. And so it's all scaled to this time and this peak flow rate. And then it follows the typical shape, the curve linear shape that's defined by the SES method. And then here is the hydrograph for the storm in question. So if I ended up with more than an inch of rainfall excess, then it's simply going to do a linear scaling of this hydrograph based on increasing and decreasing amounts. Um, now what about the time to peak? How would that change? Well, the time to peak is just based on the slope 
the storage, and the flow length. And so unfortunately, this method isn't sensitive to changes in that. All right, so uh, we've been at it for about an hour. Let's take our traditional break. And when we uh, get back together, we are going to talk about physical measurement of lag time rather than these kind of estimations and empirical approaches that we've been discussing so far. I'll leave this up on the screen during the break in case you want to continue to look at it a little bit. Hmm, has this been recording that whole time? No, okay. So um, before we move on to this next stuff, are there any questions related to uh, the unit hydrograph method? Okay. On the homework, the first problem that I gave you is kind of a multi-step problem. And what I ask you to do is use the NRCS method for uh, finding the amount of rainfall excess, and then the SCS method for estimating the unit hydrograph. So they're both kind of called the NRCS method, but this method tells you how much precipitation excess there's going to be. And then the other method, which we went over today, relates uh, basin parameters to the lag time. And then once you've defined the lag time, you can make a runoff hydrograph with this table. So it's putting those two things together. And then there's even a shout out to uh, um, pond design, just to kind of keep that fresh in your mind, the idea that you know, in an after development state, you're going to be increasing the amount of uh, runoff from a basin. So looking at how big would the pond need to be to get the um, post-development runoff back down to pre-development runoff uh, levels. So uh, if you have questions on that assignment, then feel free to let me know. You've got two weeks to work on it. I don't think it should be very lengthy, but it kind of integrates several different lectures together. All right, so uh, the next part that I wanted to tell you about is related to that presentation that I gave when I was over in the UAE a couple of weeks ago. And it ties in uh, pretty well to what we've been discussing today, which is lag time. And uh, this is a presentation that I gave along with uh, a guy that I've been collaborating with, collaborating with in the UAE. His name's Surter Adebe. And uh, he's one of my colleagues that I met last year when I was on sabbatical. I knew him before, but we worked together for the first time last year on this research project. So um, a lot of people over there don't really know where West Virginia is. I mean, outside the United States, sometimes people have heard of Los Angeles, they've heard of New York, maybe Florida, but West Virginia is not real high on the list of places that people have heard of. And uh, probably when you were in China, you'd never heard of West Virginia before maybe into told you about them, right? Yeah. So I was explaining to people that West Virginia is a little bit different from a lot of the United States. And one of the things is that, uh, you know, because we have so many stream crossings, the DOH has a huge inventory of bridges and culverts. And I, I, I was talking one time to a, a guy in the, um, what's the it's it called uh, hydrology and drainage section. You know, I'm drawing a blank what they call themselves. That I think it's hydraulics and drainage. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, I think he was telling me that they have more than 200,000 bridges and culverts in their inventory, and that's just in the DOH's inventory. You know, if you were to count up the number of uh, county uh, maintained culverts and then just uh, culverts operated by individual landowners, it's probably through the roof. There's a lot. Um, I gave this presentation to kind of like a general environmental engineering conference. And so it's possible that when you're in an environment like that, there are a lot of people who don't think in terms of hydrology. And so I just wanted to lay the groundwork for the people I was talking to, the idea that a watershed is bounded by geography and the drainage, define, the drainage divide is usually a ridge line and then at the end of that watershed outlet, we define the outlet as basically just a place that we're interested in, such as where a road is going to be crossing a stream and we have to figure out how big a culvert's going to be. And um, so to do that hydraulic design, we have to know what the flow rate is. And 
The problem is, is that here in the state of West Virginia, there are very few places where there's a direct measurement of flow rate. Um, here's a list of the USGS and the stream gauges that they operate throughout the state. And there's about 100 of them. And so if you remember back to the number that I was citing earlier of bridges and culverts in the state, there's around 200,000. And way less than 1% of those have any direct measurements that are saying, what's the flow rate? And making matters worse is these are stream gauges that are in operation now. But these gauges haven't been in operation for 25, 50, or 100 years. So we don't have extensive historical data for very many sites in the state. And so you can't size a uh, culvert based on actual measured flow rate. You have to have some way of predicting what the flow is going to be sometime in the future. And so it's kind of like, in some ways, a double extrapolation. Because not only you are extrapolating on the location where you've never measured flow data before, but you're also extrapolating through time to say, what's the flow rate going to be? Not now, but what's going to be the flow rate at some really extreme conditions of uh, sometime a long time in the future when you have a, a critical rainfall event. So this NRCS approach for predicting the precipitation excess or the runoff uh, is pretty well accepted. And as long as you have a uh, a solid description of the curve number, then you can get a good estimation of the runoff. But the problem is that these equations only define the runoff amount. And so the units of this Q would either be volume, if you've multiplied it by an area, or it can be in terms of depth. So how many inches of precipitation excess. And so these are amounts, and to size the, the diameter of the culvert or to size a uh, uh, to know what the flow depth through a, a channel is going to be, you know, if you're going to be putting in a bridge, then you need to know the timing of the runoff, not just the amount. It's not the volume of flow that goes through a culvert that matters, it's the flow rate. And so this NRCS method for estimating the runoff depth isn't by itself enough. And so that's why we use the, um, the unit hydrograph approach to relate this idea of lag time to a peak flow rate. And earlier tonight, I already introduced the idea of the lag time being from the midpoint of some rainfall pulse until when you observe the peak flow. Now, rain doesn't behave like this perfect representation. It never rains like where it just instantly begins and then is a constant rainfall intensity and then instantly stops. But what we can do is we can kind of find like the center of area for a rainfall event. And we can measure from the midpoint of that center of area to the time of peak. Another thing I wanted to emphasize is that this represents excess rainfall. And so we also have to account for some initial amount of re rainfall is satisfying the abstractions before we even start the clock. And so this along the horizontal axis is time zero. And so we don't necessarily um, measure, we don't start time zero the first drop of rainfall, but we have to, uh, for a certain watershed, get an idea of what the uh, initial abstraction is. Anybody remember from last week what we, what we guessed as a rule of, of thumb for the initial abstraction? Exactly, that's right. 0.2 times S, where S was the storage that you can base, that you can calculate based on the curve number. So keep that in mind. When I show you some actual runoff data, I don't measure the, I don't start the, uh, the point at which the storm begins when the precipitation starts, but it's more centered around the midpoint of the rainfall. So. There are ways to estimate L based on the geospatial data that we can get from a um, land use and soil type, which will help us to estimate the S value, and then an elevation model where you can download data from online that just says what's the slope of the ground. And if you know the slope of the ground, then you can get this parameter pretty easily. But what you can also do, are there are programs out there that will compare for a certain cell um, if you have a square cell, it will say what is the elevation. That's just the only thing that 
is in a DEM is an elevation, but then there's also a cell next to it in all of the directions is elevation in surrounding cells. And so each cell is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cells. And so if this one is lower than the cell in the middle, then the flow is going to go this way. And so it's this comparison, like all cells are compared to the ones around it, and they kind of come up with flow directions for each cell and they can automatically delineate the watershed area based on only having the elevation data. And once you've automatically delineated where the watershed boundaries are, it can automatically calculate the flow length as well. So there are some really nice ways to, in an automated, quick and easy fashion, estimate the lag time. Um, so here is an illustration of some effects that we'd see comparing a small watershed and a large one. You know, if you had these rainfall pulses, a small watershed that has what's described as a flashy response would have a very um, big, rapid response to a rainfall pulse. So you can see that there's relatively short time between when the rainfall occurs and where that peak is. Uh, in the case of a larger watershed, it's going to move the peaks further away in time, um, and so there would be more of a delay. But then the other thing that happens is that the peaks start to smear together, because in a large watershed, as we've talked about, just the routing effect of longer travel times um, kind of mutes the effect of, uh, of the flashiness in a small watershed. Yes, yeah, and, and the challenge is, is we, so here, this is one lag time. We could measure another one here, and it would likely be different. And the experimental data that I'm going to show you is actually there, wa there were different lag times based on how intense the storm was. But yes, they can each be treated individually. So for the last two years, what I've been studying is how well traditional methods like this formula, how good are they for predicting the lag time in a place like West Virginia? And West Virginia is unique because we have really, really steep topography. And equations like this weren't originally designed for such steep topography as we have. You know, a, a watershed slope of more than 40% is well outside the range of the uh, data set that was used to calibrate these equations. And so I've just been curious because um, I had a conversation with a, a guy at DOH a number of years ago, and they admitted that they don't feel really confident when they're estimating the lag time based on geospatial data. So the watersheds I'm interested in are small ones. And the reason I'm interested in a small watershed is because they're the ones that are um, most likely to be ungaged. And small watersheds are also the ones that are likely to have a culvert rather than a bridge. Because if you've got a really large watershed, that means you're going to have a, a bigger flow rate. And so um, bridges are built with a lot more analysis than culverts sometimes are. Sometimes culverts are set in place without any analysis, right? When you're in a hurry and you've got to do 100 miles of, uh, of roads and stuff. So uh, small watersheds are what I'm interested in, ones that are really steep. And by steep, what I meant was more than 10% average basin slope, which is at the low end of what you can see in West Virginia, and then extreme land cover characteristics. So these first two, I was able to quantify what I meant, but extreme is kind of like a, uh, a qualitative description. And so here is one end of the extreme. This is a picture of some really heavily vegetated land in West Virginia, and so it's extreme because the depth of the forest litter is going to be so thick. And so that's really going to slow down the movement of water over the ground surface. And so we've got these intermingled variables with the really steep terrain in some places, which would speed up the time of concentration and the lag time. But then on the other hand, you've got a really thick mat of organic material, which is slowing down the, uh, uh, the water's movement over the surface. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. 
this isn't necessarily the best thing to illustrate like the detrius itself but the contrast here is just heavily vegetated is at one end of the extreme and the other end of the extreme is the watersheds that I was working with in the UAE that are very sparsely vegetated so you're right this picture isn't the forest litter this is just meant to, to show like a very lush verdant landscape that underneath that probably is some organic material that we don't see yeah quite a contrast right I took this picture when I was on a run one day. You really have to be careful when you're out here because uh, it's so dry that you can, uh, you can really get dehydrated quickly, a lot, a lot faster than I was used to from being in West Virginia. Um, so we've talked about some of the, the theory behind it, and uh, the reason why it's important to accurately quantify lag time and to have an accurate representation of hydrology in general is just you know, water can be really devastating when uh, we don't have adequate infrastructure to convey it. And I think this is a picture from Richwood, West Virginia last summer when they had a lot of problematic flooding. Has anybody here been to any of the flood zones since that happened last summer? Where did you go? Oh, really? And uh, what did you see? <laughs> Just ripped up by the, the scour? It's not that they were buried, it was removed. Yeah. Where did, did you go somewhere? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Jeremy, did you see? Uh... I didn't hear about that. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I see. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. So people were stranded for a while then. <laughs> Just to get them out of there. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's like a ghost town, huh? Yeah. That's fascinating. I never even heard about that. See, I was out of the country when that happened, so I missed all the excitement. It's like Elk View, it's called? I'm going to have to check that out. Huh. I see. So it's not so far out of Charleston. No. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I drove through White Sulphur Springs on the way home from Washington, D.C. when I got back into the country not knowing. I mean, I, I knew that there was a flood and stuff, but I didn't know that White Sulphur Springs had been hit. I mean, I was just looking for some place to buy a hamburger. So we pulled off the side of the road, and it was a ghost town. Uh, their road wasn't ripped out. It was just covered in silt. So it was like driving on a mat of... Uh, of silt and all the gas stations were closed there was no obviously no hamburgers to be purchased but it was like really eerie it was like the walking dead in a way you know how like just things are just kind of messed up and empty so it can have a lot of consequences and so uh, I think you know this is something that I'd been studying even before the flooding happened but it's something that makes the issue of uh, flash flooding more accessible to people when you tell them that you want to measure how long it takes from when the rain starts until the flash flood arrives, people who've been through an experience like this tend to understand uh, the impact that flash flooding can have. But ironically, it's not just here in West Virginia that where we have a lot of rain and really steep watersheds that flooding is a problem, but even in an arid place like in Saudi Arabia, they can have flash flooding there as well. And so these photos are taken from Dammam, Saudi Arabia. And uh, so they, you can see people trying to make the best of the situation, driving through the water because you know, life has to go on. Some people end up in overpasses where the, uh, the water can stall the vehicle, and I think all of these cars are probably finished. 
but uh, you can see that just as homes in West Virginia are affected by the problematic flooding, here are some really nice looking uh, villas that have been basically isolated because of the storm. So the question becomes what to do with leftover water. You know, we think of it as a resource, but sometimes it's also problematic, and so it's a risk and a resource at the same time. And this is a picture in the Emirates where um, the water that comes out of the wadis, you can see that th this watershed is covered by basically rocks that um, have a lot of fines at the surface as well, very fine dust. And so it's, even though it's very parched soil that you'd think would be really good at absorbing water, there are some places, because it's rock which doesn't absorb water well, or the, uh, the soil is covered with a, a fine powder that doesn't allow infiltration very effectively, the, uh, the water rushes through these. It's steep and the water isn't absorbing very quickly. And so one of the solutions in some places is just to direct all of that flow out into the ocean. This is the Indian Ocean here. And so uh, unfortunately, even though it's a precious resource, you can't always um, harness that and put it to good use. But more recently, what they've begun doing is putting in a lot of groundwater recharge dams in the UAE. And this is uh, the Wadi Medina Dam out in, uh, in the central area of the UAE where they've got some more mountains. And um, so that dam exists just to, when there is rainwater runoff, to trap it and to uh, allow infiltration to occur. And so it's only, you know, there's water in this dam probably, I'd say, four weeks out of the year. But those four weeks are very important because as the water infiltrates down into the ground, uh, it brings the water table back up and then it allows farms like these, and this farm is just within walking distance of the dam, um, and they're not using the water directly, they're not using the surface water for this farm, but uh, this farm is just uh, using groundwater where they pump it up and if the groundwater isn't recharged, then the groundwater levels get lower and lower and lower every year and then it kind of threatens the long-term viability of the farm. Uh, so all sorts of uh, vegetables are grown out in an area that previously was just like the surrounding uh, rocks. It's just really amazing what they can get to grow if the water is available and can be harnessed as a resource. So here is one of the watersheds that I was working with. This is a, a photo that's based on an aerial image that's just a, this is a side view in Google Earth. And here is an actual photograph of the same watershed from about the same perspective. And so you can see that it's uh, very steep. And one of the things I wanted to look at was the effect of slope. But this was like a real exercise in compare and contrast. Because I previously, before going to the Emirates, had gathered data in West Virginia with similar watersheds about the same size, similar slope. Um, and the big difference being that the West Virginia watersheds were heavily vegetated and these watersheds are very sparsely vegetated. And so it's kind of like a control. You know, whenever you do an experiment, you want to have one be the experimental control and one being the uh, whatever's receiving the effect. So you can differentiate between two different types of behavior. Um, another thing besides the slope is the land cover. And so the slopes were the same between West Virginia watersheds and UAE watersheds, but the land covers couldn't be more different. Um, so what I did was I took these pressure gauges, and this pressure gauge has a built-in data logger that you can program it to take pressure measurements at whatever intervals you want. In my case, I was having it measure the pressure every two minutes. And so I would leave one of these pressure gauges in the atmosphere, just uh, above where I expected water to be. And then I'd put one of these pressure gauges in a metal pipe in the channel where I knew that the water would go if, you know, if, if there was flow. And um, it's sensitive enough and calibrated so that even uh, you know, a couple of millimeters of water, it's going to be able to detect as an increase in pressure just based on the hydrostatic equation. And so you would basically subtract out the atmospheric pressure and any pressure over and above atmospheric you're going to read as water depth. So I'm measuring the time with a very precise clock 
that the water arrives to the sensor, and I'm also measuring the time with the precise clock that the rainfall occurs. And so this is the rain gauge that I used, and it's called a tipping bucket rain gauge. Uh, you can't really see too well with this picture, but a tipping bucket rain gauge, what it does is um, inside here is um, a little, they call it a bucket, but it's more of just kind of like a tray that has, uh, it, it's on, um, on an axis, and so when one one-hundredth of an inch of rain accumulates in that tray, it's enough to cause it to tip over and empty, but then it records the time that it tipped, and then water starts accumulating in the other side, so it just tips back and forth, back and forth, and then the clock that's on board is synchronized to the same time as the rainfall, as the stream gauge sensor, and so I can compare the time of the precipitation to the time of the runoff. And so here's a picture of my rain gauge just sort of all by itself, and it was kind of like a, a nerve-wracking thing because, uh, you know, I had a couple thousand dollars worth of equipment in the, in the field, and I just would walk away from it, you know, and it's kind of in plain view. It's not like it's hidden really well, although there's not a lot of people out here. It's kind of uh, isolated. Um, but fortunately, there was I mean, nobody disturbed it. I don't know if anybody ever saw it. Probably not, but no camels stepped on it. No, there, there's no problems with the, the data. Um, so when I had my two watersheds picked out, I was able to do a geospatial analysis and find out the watershed area and the slope based on the DEM data. And I measured the maximum flow distance and measured the S value based on an assumption of the soil type. And so all those things go into the SCS method, which predicted for the smaller watershed I should expect 12-minute lag time and 29-minute lag time for the larger of the two watersheds I was working with. So this is predicted. And I just wanted to measure the difference between the predicted and the actual. So I, I got all the way over there, and I proposed a year before I went to the UAE, I had to propose it to Marshall. And people always kind of like would raise their eyebrows when I said I wanted to go measure uh, storm data in the desert. They think, oh, really? So you're going to go to the desert to measure storms, right? So I always was a little nervous. Uh, are the skeptics going to be right? You know, I knew it rained over there because I had lived there before, but it only rains I mean, maybe one or two days a year, and there were some years where I don't remember there being any rain. So the, the question was, did it rain? And uh, I saw this newspaper article when I was over there. I think it was maybe in September that this article was published and it was predicting a wet winter and so I felt partly vindicated at least the experts were saying let's expect rain so I was feeling pretty comfortable when I saw that but I felt even more comfortable when the storms actually started to roll in and it was an unusually wet winter when I was there uh, in fact there were seven big storms that happened out in the mountains um, unfortunately uh, they weren't big there were seven measurable storms um, I measured all seven with my rainfall gauge, but the stream gauge, because it fills up so quickly, I can only carry one month of data at a time, and then it stops recording. One of the really nice storms uh, happened like one day after my gauge filled up, and I wasn't able to go reset it. So what I ended up getting was four storms that were big enough to observe some runoff from them. So remember that the... Uh, the rainfall hydrograph that I showed you before had a shape that looked like this. It was sort of just like the rain starts, it's a constant intensity, and then immediately stops. That's the idealized version of uh, precipitation excess. Now, in this case, the rainfall is kind of slow, and then the intensity goes up, and then the intensity goes down. Um, so one of the challenges of comparing the real data to the model was trying to pick out, all right, so where is that midpoint that I should start measuring things from? Because the midpoint was pretty obvious in the theory. It's just the middle of this perfect bar. But kind of the art of interpreting data is finding where is the middle of the bar in both of these cases. So these are two of the early storms, 
and then there were two other where the intensity was pretty high for a short period. So intensities uh, approaching 20 centimeters per hour. So it's fairly intense, but they're short duration storms. You know, 20 minutes and they're finished. Flash, flash floods. So was there runoff? You know, there are so many things that could go wrong there. I mean, the storms could have been light enough that it didn't satisfy the initial abstraction. And there were a couple of those where I measured precipitation, but there was no runoff. Uh, the other things that could go wrong is I could fill up my um, data logger before I got a chance to go and get the data off. And uh, sometimes that, that happened once, that I missed a really nice, beautiful storm because my data logger was full. But I still did get some runoff data from some of this. And so here I've drawn an arrow just to show the time of concentration from the center point of the precipitation to the observed peak. And again, there's a little bit of an art of interpreting these as well. So notice how in the large watershed it seems like it's going down and then it starts going up again. You kind of have to relate, well, here was a peak of intensity, then it went down, and the peak went up again. And so there's a little bit of subjectivity to this, but over the course of the four storms, I'm comparing the small and the large watershed with four different storms. I'm measuring the time for each of them. And uh, so what it worked out to is on average for the large watershed, I observed a nine minute time for the, for the lag time compared to 29 minutes is what was predicted according to the NRCS approach. And four minutes is what was predicted for the small watershed, whereas the model said it would take 12. So it's kind of remarkable in both of these cases, it's about one-third the time that was predicted. So the model is really overestimating how long it takes for the peak flow to arrive. So any guesses on why do you think it's overestimating? Why is the actual so much less than the predicted? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're outside of the calibrated range. You know, like, uh, this model really wasn't meant to be used in some place that has such a high curve number. So I assigned a relatively high curve number for this area because, um, because there's very little vegetation. And the other thing that we're outside of the range on is how steep it is. And so, um, you know, the water is moving a lot more quickly than the model would expect because there's nothing in inhibiting its movement over the surface. There's no forest litter, remember? And um, so it was kind of interesting to have this comparison. And uh, so what I found from that, the conclusions were that, number one, the peak flows arrive a lot faster than the SCS lag time method would predict. And there are other methods, and over time I plan to continue this research I have a collaborator in the UAE who's still gathering storm data this year. And so we're going to find a variety of these empirical equations, compare them to what we observed. But ultimately, we're going to have to develop empirical equations that are calibrated just to the region and to the unique land characteristics that they've got, the unique topography of really steep basins. Um, and so the reason why we think it arrives much quicker is because it's extremely steep and um, the other thing we noticed is the relationship between lag time and intensity. Let me go back to this table from before. Now look at, for each of these storms, I've got the rainfall intensity here and then the measured lag time. So for the large watershed, one of the storms was as fast as five minutes, but then one of them, it took 15 minutes. But then it, that makes sense when you look at the rainfall intensity for those storms. So when the rainfall intensity was low, the lag time was longer. When the rainfall intensity is high, then the lag time is less. So you know we've seen that trend before. Earlier in the course, some of our uh, methods for time of concentration took the rainfall intensity as a factor. And there's an inverse relationship. High rainfall intensity, low time of concentration. And so it's consistent with some of the theory that's out there. Um, 
So that's one of the conclusions is that whatever method we develop needs to, uh, to take that into account, that the rainfall intensity has a, a really important role to play in predicting the lag time. Um, so where I'm headed in the, in the future is to continue comparisons between West Virginia and the UAE, because they're at these two ends of the spectrum. Uh, and trying to isolate the effect of the forest litter because West Virginia times of concentration, as you might expect, the ones that I've observed are a lot longer than what I observed in the Emirates. Uh, in fact, it just the, the forest litter, so far it seems like it about doubles. So in West Virginia, it's still, the predicted time is too long, but it's not like three times too long like it was in the UAE. It's it's sort of uh, the reality is about on the order of 10, uh, sorry, for, the, for a, a watershed of this large size, it would be about 20 rather than 30, whereas in the UAE it's about 10 instead of 30. So the, uh, the force litter really does sl slow things down a lot. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of places in West Virginia that are being made to look like this um, through mountaintop removal. You know, they'll completely deforest certain parts of the state and then what they dump over the edge is rock fill. And so this is a, a desiccated landscape with very little vegetation and lots of rock at the surface. And so there are places in the state, even here in West Virginia, that maybe having data like this is important to be able to predict what's going to happen lag time wise to uh, places that have had mining development and the mountaintop removal. So that's another, th another direction that I want to take these findings to is, you know, the implications it has for mining and land development that's increasing the imperviousness of the surface. So uh, my collaborator, like I mentioned before, is continuing to gather more and more lag time data there in the UAE. I'm doing the same thing here in West Virginia. So you have to have a pretty big uh, body of data. You can't just create your own equation based on two watersheds or even four watersheds. And usually you need 20 data points to create something that's statistically significant. So it'll take a while to do that. Um, you can use the data to improve your uh, sizing of culverts. And that's where I kind of started this presentation was telling you that in West Virginia there's hundreds of thousands of culverts in the state that are being sized based on guesses. And if we can improve the accuracy of the guess, not only of the flow rate, but also the, the time of concentration, if you can improve the accuracy of the guess, then you can improve the cost efficiency of the design. So um, you don't have to make them unnecessarily conservative if you have a more clear and defensible estimate of what the time of concentration is. Um, they have culverts in the UAE as well. And this is a culvert that's actually pretty big. This is a photo of me a while back. It's about twice as tall as I am. Um, and so they're expecting some pretty significant flows. And you'll notice here along the, uh, the face of the culvert, they've got rocks that actually have a fence over it. So this would actually perform really well in case of overtopping. And they're, they're not leaving anything to chance here. If, if there's flow that exceeds the capacity of the culvert, then this fill that's under the road, it's not going anywhere. It's going to be very secure. Um, but the question is, you know, on what basis did they size this? Did they size this knowing that the lag time predicted would be too slow, and so then they just took it to some extreme? Um, if you can improve the predictions of the lag time, then you can improve the predictions of flow rate. And so culvert improvement uh, in the sizing is where I think it can be applied. And uh, also those dams, those infiltration dams that I showed you, sometimes they have the problem of at the dam, because anytime you've got moving water, it also takes soil particles with it. And what moves the most easily is really fine particles. And so fine particles will accumulate along with the water at the dam. And so this is supposed to be a groundwater recharge dam that's promoting infiltration. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is you have an accumulation of sediment at the dam. And the really fine particles interfere with the movement of water down uh, under the ground. And so 
I think this kind of data, quantifying the time of concentration, can be used to identify locations to have intermediate uh, infiltration dams before uh, a lot of velocity starts picking up particles and uh, try and limit the amount of uh, fines that accumulate at one big giant dam if you had smaller dams upstream. So that's another application of data like this. So here's my collaborator in the UAE. Uh, he now is kind of carrying the torch of going out into the desert and finding watersheds that we can uh, instrument. And unfortunately, it hasn't been as wet in these mountains last, uh, th this past winter as the winter that I was there. But he did have the instruments in the field for the big storm that caused this flooding. Uh, let's see. Those photos in Damam. The storm that caused all of this, he had the uh, sensors in the field then, and I should be getting that data in just a couple of days. So it'll be interesting to see if we got some runoff there. So that's physical measurement of lag time. Any questions about that? No? Yeah? That's a good question. I, I'd need to go back and remind me, myself what I assumed. I, I, didn't, I didn't assume 98, but because uh, I've got it right here, let's see if I can pull it up easily. Um, This is the program that we're going to start using after spring break, WMS. Um, so, okay, so if I double click on this, I think I'm going to be able to pull up its properties. Curve number, uh, it's not in here. No, it wasn't, it wasn't zero. It's not reading it in. Um, uh, that's a great question. It's been so long since I estimated it, I don't remember exactly what I used. It was in the 90s, but uh, I need to, to go back through and remind myself, sorry, that's like the most basic question you could ask, and I can't even answer that. Somewhere in the 90s. I didn't assume concrete, but since, you know, when I looked at the tables of uh, unvegetated areas, it's hard to justify anything lower than the upper 80s, even when you've got... Um, like moderate soils, and, and these are so rocky and with so many fines at the surface that I assumed, I think, about soil type C kind of behavior. So it was in the upper 80s or lower 90s, but I need to go back through and remind myself what exactly I assumed. All right, so uh, I'll send you an email with a link to download WMS rather than just having you go out and search for that yourself. I'll send you an email with a reminder that you should download it because when we get together in class on uh, Wednesday after spring break, we're actually going to dive right into the WMS. In the, uh, the course schedule, didn't have us getting there so quickly, but I actually combined today's lecture with what we're supposed to do um, the week after spring break. So we're ahead of schedule. See, we were going to do watershed instrumentation and lag time a lecture after spring break, but we combined that with today. So we'll start right into the WMS when we get together on Wednesday the 29th. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you. I guess we'll let out a little bit early. Let me know if you've got any questions as you're working on that homework assignment. And have a great spring break.
you guys are going to be working, right? You've got a big project, but the rest of us, we'll be on vacation, so. Oh, you did? Where'd you go?